Good morning and welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today as we meet for our second Advent worship service, Sunday worship service, the emphasis is about being prepared. God's messenger, John the Baptist, came to prepare God's people. And that message is a message that still prepares us today for the coming of our Savior the second time into this world. Let's begin our worship with the singing of our first hymn, hymn number two. follow the order of worship, service of the word. It is on page 38 in the very front of your hymnal, page 38. We also welcome those who may be worshiping with us from afar this morning in Sitka, Cordova, Kodiak, Prudhoe Bay, Happy Valley, Willow, Alaska, Willa, Willow, Alaska, and North Pole, Alaska. Rodeo, Los Alamos, and Silver City, New Mexico. Douglas, Arizona. Lagodi, Indiana. Raymond, Mississippi. Winfield and Belleville, Kansas, welcome. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Stir up our hearts, O Lord, to prepare the way for your only Son. By his coming, give us strength in our conflicts and shed light on our path through the darkness of this world. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the scripture readings. Oh, somebody's uh, vehicle is... Okay, great, thank you. Our first lesson for this, the second Sunday of Advent, is recorded in Isaiah the prophet, chapter 40, beginning with the first verse. After 39 chapters of doom and gloom, of talking of the thunderclouds of God's wrath that were going to fall upon God's people and upon the nations around Israel, there finally is a ray of hope as Isaiah the prophet speaks about the comfort that only God can bring. Listen to the words. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say the towns of Judah, here is your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Here ends our Old Testament reading. We continue with the singing of our next hymn, hymn number 47. <laughs>
Our second lesson is recorded in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with the third verse. This is also the sermon text for this morning. Peter writes, First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to, effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. Here ends our second lesson. Hallelujah. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for Him. All mankind will see God's salvation. Hallelujah. rise for the gospel reading. <coughs> the Holy Gospel is recorded in the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the first verse. In fulfillment of God's promise of a forerunner of the Savior, we open up the book of Mark and we see that promise fulfilled in the man, John the Baptist. The beginning of the Gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore, wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here ends our Gospel reading. Please be seated. We continue with the singing of our sermon hymn, which is hymn number 16.
Grace, pardon, and everlasting life are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. God's word for our meditation is taken from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with the third verse. I invite you to follow along on the back side of your service folder or in the Bible in the pew in which you're seated. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with the third verse. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. This is God's Word. We bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, as we hear this section from 2 Peter today, please send us your Holy Spirit. May He calm our heart as He points us to Your Son, Jesus. Strengthen our faith. For His sake we ask this. Amen. Dear friends, you're wise to have smoke detectors in your house, but you're foolish if you don't change the batteries. Now one of the nice things about some of the new fire or smoke alarms is that when those batteries get pretty low they start to beep that irritating beep and have you ever noticed it happens in the middle of the night I think it's when we turn down you know the heater for the day we crawl into bed we're finally sleeping we're having a a nice restful sleep and all of a sudden that beep goes off And then you go and you start looking for which one it is. And you know how irritating that can be. But I'm glad that that's there because if there wasn't that beep, I wouldn't be prepared by changing that battery just in case that smoke alarm decides to finally go off when there is a fire in the house. We prepare for a lot of things in our life. And we prepare by making sure that our insurance premiums are paid up. We prepare for the worst when we're preparing over time for our retirement. And if you think about that, that's a tremendous amount of preparation. If you look at the amount of hours that it takes to prepare for retirement, it's unbelievable. And first of all, you have to go to school. And it probably takes us from first grade through 12th grade about 15,000 hours to be prepared for that next step, which may be college or a trade school, which might add another 2,000 hours upon that number. So that's a lot of time spent before a person actually begins to work. And then all the years that a person works, hopefully there's some preparation going on 
for retirement. So we do prepare. We prepare for retirement. This section of God's Word is talking about us, about us being prepared for the day, for the last day, the judgment day, the day when Jesus will return again and come in glory and judge the living and the dead. Apostle Peter is encouraging us through these words to spend a little bit more time preparing for that day. I am certain that we probably spend more time preparing for the things of this life sometimes than we do for preparing for the next life. I think the world sometimes tries to close its eyes to this section of God's Word that talks about the last day. And of course there's a lot of things there that may make a person just kind of cringe when you think about it. If we were to bring in the other sections of Scripture that talk about the last day though, there are some very comforting promises that our God gives to us about what will happen on that day. And how the dead in Christ will rise first. And then after that, those who are still living will be snatched up off of this world before what Peter is talking about actually happens. But the world doesn't necessarily want to think about that day. That last day is going to come. The world that's around us sometimes might look at that as an ancient superstition and they might get a chuckle out of it. Because, just like Peter says, there are going to come scoffers in time who are going to say, you know, it hasn't happened up till this point. Where is this coming that he's talking about? But when Peter does talk about what will happen, he has it on good authority. That this is exactly what is going to happen to this world. This world is not meant to last forever. But God has another world in mind for us. It's easy to see why so many don't want to think about this. The only world that we know is right here, and this world passing away may cause us to be just a little bit on edge. I think it can strike fear in us. Because there are sections of Scripture that speak very, very fearfully about what will happen at the end. St. Paul speaks of it as a day when the Lord will come in a flaming fire to take vengeance on all of them that know not God and don't obey the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. St. John calls that great day of, uh, a great day of God's wrath. And the prophets spoke of it as a day of trouble and darkness. A day of darkness and gloominess. But then the Apostle Peter he tells us to look for that day and don't be afraid. Peter didn't want Christians to be afraid of the last day. And so he spends a lot of time talking about this in his second letter. He wanted them rather to look forward to it with joy and longing. And this is the way that Jesus spoke about it when He said, When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. You know, And as children of God who have found forgiveness at the foot of the cross and through Jesus' blood poured out for us, it is something that we do look forward to. We don't have a reason to be afraid because we know that He has taken away our sins, and the reason that He's taken away our sins is His great love for us. And when we think about Jesus coming on that day, yes, He is going to be the judge, but He's more than just a judge. We're also told that Jesus is our advocate. He's our attorney. He's the one who is going to be defending us. And there's every reason to believe that he is going to say not guilty because of what he has done and not what we have done. Because finally, not only is he the, the judge, the defense attorney, but he is also the bondman who had paid the fine and he paid the full penalty 
for all of our sins. And so you see, there isn't, there isn't much for us to be afraid of when it comes to these sections of God's Word that speak about the last day. Because He's going to give us a not guilty verdict. And it is certain. And when that day comes, it's going to bring us the greatest joy of all. In fact, when our Savior talks about that, He reminds us that on that day, we're going to see Him again. He's going to take us to be with Him. And in the book of Revelation, this is the way He describes it. He says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Wow. I hang on those words where he says there will be no more death, mourning, or crying, or pain. Whew. What a place that's going to be, isn't it? What's still greater is though is the fact that we will be with our Savior. We'll be with Him. Peter writes, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. What hope and great joy we have because we have a Savior that we know personally, the Savior Jesus. I think that's one of the reasons why why the Gospel writer John and the, the same person who wrote the book of Revelation, at the end of that book he says, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Because we weren't meant to live on this world forever. It is a place where there is sin that infects all of us. And it infects the things that we do. It infects our relationships. It brings sadness. It brings difficulties. It brings complications into our hearts and into our lives. And sometimes those things can be a tremendous burden that we carry. You know, we experience the sorrows, the losses, the heartbreaks of this life. And when the Apostle Peter wrote these words, he wanted to make sure that our eyes were open, but also that we were looking beyond the things, the difficulties of this life. Now that day is coming. He wants us to be prepared. We've been tremendously blessed here on earth. And especially our generation, our country, more than any other country in the world, has the blessings of modern day conveniences that we do take for granted. Wow. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day when um, my phone didn't work. It just stopped. And I couldn't understand why it did. And And I couldn't call the company because, guess what? My phone doesn't work. So I ended up having to drive all the way back to the church from where I was. And I spent about a half an hour on the phone, on the landline here at church. Thank goodness for the landline. Until I got it straightened out so that my phone would work again. But it made me stop and think, well, what what did I do 10, 15 years ago when all we had was a landline? Maybe, maybe life was less stressful. But it got me to think about just the tremendous blessings that we have besides having a phone that not only we talk to people on, but it can help us navigate the streets. It can take pictures. It can send texts. It can send messages all over the world. And that's just one device. We've been tremendously blessed with material blessings. And sometimes I think we can get hung up on that. Those are the things that consume us sometimes to the point where we lose sight of the fact that our Savior says, I'm going to come again. I'm going to come again because this sinful world isn't where I want you to spend eternity. I want you to spend eternity with me in heaven. 
where there is no sin, where there is no sorrow, where there is no pain, where there is no suffering, where there's only sinfulness and joy in living in the presence of God. The day is coming. He wants us to be prepared. You know, the Savior doesn't... The Savior, when He describes what was going on at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah and at the time of the flood, when He talks about it, it doesn't sound any different than the times that we're living in. In fact, when Jesus describes what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah and before the flood, He doesn't say that there was a lot of crime in those days. He doesn't talk about uh, the fact that there was idolatry or adultery and those sorts of things that were going on. No, you know how he describes it? He says they ate, they drank, they married, were given in marriage, they, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And really, when you think about it, there isn't anything there that we would call a sin. But it's clear that these people were concerned only with the things of this world. Because these things in and of themselves are not wicked. But that's what was happening then. The same things are happening today. We go about our lives, and our lives do consume us. If we don't set aside time to continue to focus our eyes again and again on our God, then we will lose sight of the fact that He's coming again. Then we'll be like those who didn't have enough oil in their lamp when the bridegroom came. Our God wants us to be prepared and we don't know when He's going to come. And I think that, that is one of the things that Peter addresses in this section too. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's why Jesus hasn't come again. He hasn't come yet. Because He's patient. He knows that there are those out there who need to hear that message, who need to know that they have a Savior, who need to know that there is a heaven waiting for them because Jesus paid the price, the entry price for them. They need to know that it's free. But He's patient. Because not everybody knows. He wants us to be prepared. And part of that Preparation may be the fact that God may use us. He may use us to tell someone, to tell someone about Him. But sometimes I think we're very much like the world that we live in. You know, Cassie might be able to tell you with a new puppy that puppy is probably very eager to please and eager to obey. But I can remember. I can remember when we had a puppy and you could say to Pappy, lay down. And he'd lay down. But a few moments later, he'd be up. You'd tell him down. And he'd go back down. But then, maybe less than 30 seconds later, he would be up and his tail would be wagging and he'd be distracted by something or another. It's going to take a lot of practice, a lot of training before a puppy actually listens and is focused on obeying the master. You know, we're not puppies, but I think it's very easy for us to get distracted. We get distracted by all sorts of things out there. I mean, there's, there's things like, oh my goodness, career, family, hobbies, anger, lust, greed, not to mention worry, doubt, or maybe being uh, our need for being popular. It only takes one of those things to distract us, and yet most likely we never face one at a time. There's always a few more coming at us. And we forget our Lord. We forget the one who is the Master. And sometimes God has to remind us of that. 
And yet God in His unconditional love goes to great lengths to protect the faith that He has put in your heart and He has put in my heart. And one of the ways that we are reminded of that is when we open up His Word, when we come and worship with fellow Christians, when we have that opportunity to come to His table and receive His tangible love in the form of the body and the blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And so there are ways that we are, are brought back to Him again and again and again. And He draws us back because He loves us. And in the process, He does train us. His desire, His plan, is to keep our lamps filled with oil so that we can rejoice when the bridegroom arrives. Now, don't say, but pastor, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We're not dogs. We're blood-bought children of God. And as blood-bought children of God, there can be changes in our hearts and in our lives and in the way we live our lives. You know, the day is coming. And Jesus wants us to continue to stay in His Word. He wants us to continue to come to worship. He wants us to continue to show His love in our lives outside of the church to those people who are around us, the people that we know and the people that we don't know. You know, there's not always going to be a beep, beep, beep of a smoke detector when it comes to our faith to remind us. You know, but the quiet whisper of God's Word and His love encourages us. You know, we are ready because Jesus makes us ready. Let's pray that Jesus would keep us ready in His Word. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith that God has given us according to the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 41. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. We continue our worship as we bring our offerings to the Lord.
Please rise for prayer. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, You repeated and affirmed Your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through Your prophets of old, You continually directed the eyes of Your people to the coming of Your Savior. We praise You, O Lord, for keeping Your promise and sending Your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of Your King, Use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to, the, take to heart the words of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, Spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your, go- and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We offer a special prayer for the Hanscom family today. Last Sunday we prayed uh, to our God for Harry, Morgan's dad, and God called him home. So we bring a message, a prayer, to our Father's throne today. Ask him to help with the family. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer Harry, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought him to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort his family, and all who mourn his death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord, who has taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptations. And bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and give you peace. Please be seated for our final hymn. It is from the songbook. This songbook it starts on page 328. 328.
Good morning to everyone this morning. Special welcome to our newcomers, visitors. We're happy to have you worshiping with us, and we invite you to share a cup of coffee and some refreshments immediately following the worship service uh, in the Narthex area. If you haven't as yet signed our guest book, it's immediately to the left as you exit the sanctuary. A uh, couple of announcements. Looking at the insert in the service folder, uh, this Wednesday is our second midweek service, and it is preceded by a potluck. Uh, we had a uh, wonderful potluck last, uh, last Wednesday, a um, lot of variety. Um, if you weren't able to join us, um, please consider joining us this week. Um, we are singing a lot of Christmas and Advent hymns. And, I mean, we looked at the list, and there's a really long list. And I think between Sunday services and Wednesday services, we're, we're getting almost everyone in. There might be some favorites that we don't hit, but uh, we're trying to, to sing all of those hymns in preparation for Christmas. Uh, some people might not like to sing the Christmas hymns before Christmas, but you know the Christmas season is just so short. So, uh, so if, with, with that said, come and join us Wednesday night. We're going to sing some more hymns. We're going to dine on some wonderful food that you bring, and, and of course, dine on God's Word. Um, also, following our worship service today, there is a um, Christmas party planned for the kids downstairs. Don't have to bring gifts. Um, everything is set. Is that correct? So all kids are welcome, and uh, even the big kids. So if you want to stick around for that, you are certainly welcome to do that. Any other announcements? Yes, Carol. Uh, speaking of kids, there is a sign-up sheet for the goodie bags for the children for Christmas Eve. Okay, very good. Out in the North Texas. Rachel, thank you for the beautiful music today. God's blessings to you this week. 